I would like to welcome you to uh, this uh, education session. The um, subject is the empowered client. It is uh, presented by Lindsay Thedeen, uh, who's with Howes. Uh, her subject uh, today will include best practices and examples of how uh, professionals differentiate their brands online. They successfully implement lead screening st strategies and positively handle difficult situation or difficult conversations with clients. Please welcome. Please help me uh, introduce uh, Lindsay. Good morning. I don't know what you're doing to me, Texas, but I am tired today. I feel like I was just not ready to give up my coffee, and then I realized it's not that early. It's 11. So I'll pull it together. Um, thanks again for joining me today. We're going to talk about the empowered client. As you guys heard, I'm Lindsay Thedeen. I'm on the industry marketing team at House. So my background is branding and marketing. Ran a consulting company in San Francisco before I joined House full time about three and a half years ago. Um, and came literally with the purpose of how can we make online marketing a little bit easier for you guys. I can't build a house. We understand that online marketing, what you guys do, it's a very different skill set. And so my whole purpose at House is to try and make your lives a little bit easier. Um, how can you be successful on the House platform? How can you be a little bit more successful just with your marketing in general? And so today we're going to be talking about, kind of starting from the very beginning, what is a little bit different with the clients these days? What can you guys do to reach that client? And then what are some steps that you guys can take to move them through the process a little bit easier? actually land that person as a new client for your business, and then make sure you get the five stars at the end. Um, I have a lot of slides, so I'm gonna try and talk really fast. I tend to get a little chatty, especially when my big coffee kicks in. So I'm gonna try to go quickly, but I will be here after if you guys have questions. I'm also over in the house booth, so you can stop by. So one of the reasons that we know that this is a really important topic is this lovely number that you see up here is the average number of times a day a person looks at their cell phone. And that is the average. So we're talking about all age groups here. When we're talking about millennials, that number is a little bit closer to 150 to 175 times a day that someone looks on their phone. And the reason that I share that is it's really changed the way that we start to absorb information. We now are starting to gather it in these micro moments. So and just to take that a step further, talking about this mobile society that we live in now, when we look at this survey that was done, you can see 87% of millennials agree, my smartphone never leaves my side day or night. 80% agree with the statement, when I wake up, the first thing I do is reach for my smartphone. 78%, I spend more than two hours every day using my smartphone. Google recently did a study over 40% of millennials researched their last purchase on a smartphone. And Google literally made the statement, if you are not mobile friendly, you don't exist. They started penalizing websites or just not even showing them in search results. When someone goes in and says, I want a custom home builder, if your website isn't mobile friendly, you don't even show up in the search results anymore. So the reason is not to make any of you guys feel bad if you're not mobile friendly yet, but this really reinforces this point that the way that we gather information has really changed. And whether we like it or not, we need to start thinking about our marketing in this mobile client and how we're starting to gather information on our smart devices. So we now call them this empowered client, right? Mobile friendly, clearly. We're on mobile devices 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We're standing in line at the grocery store. You know, it's no longer something where you have to walk through someone's doors and sit down and have a conversation, and that's when you get information. Literally, standing in line at the grocery store, trying to put the kids to bed, a client's running a little bit late. You're now starting to gather information about someone. So that means that clients nowadays are very well researched. I read another study, I always like to keep up with what's going on in marketing, especially online, and it came out and it said that 70% of the buying decision is made online. So before anyone talks to you, before they walk through your doors, they want to feel like they can get 70% of the way there, because that's the expectation now, right? We can find out probably more than we should know just by going online. So these clients now are very well researched. And they want to participate. They want to be involved in this process. You know, on house, we got a lot of people. We have over 40 million unique monthly users. About 90% of them are homeowners. And for those of you guys that are on house and active, you know they are asking all sorts of questions about your pictures. They're in the discussions. We have about 400,000 discussions happening. Those are active discussions. Those aren't total. It's active discussions within the last 24 hours. 
and not because we see house users being a big DIY crowd. They're coming, they tell us in all of our studies, they're looking to hire you guys, but they just wanna be informed and involved in the process and wanna be able to have an intelligent conversation with you guys. So that means that branding for you guys and your marketing when we're talking about these people is really now have to change a little bit to reach them. So we know it's online and it's in micro moments. Those moments when someone is trying to put the kids to bed or standing in line at the grocery store, they're starting to pull information about you. We also know that people are making decisions both emotionally and rationally. So think these are things for you guys to think about with your marketing. We all tend to make decisions emotionally, but then we have to back them up rationally. So when you guys are thinking about this, are you playing on both sides of those things? It's a multi-way conversation. No longer is it just you as the expert telling them how this is going to go. They want to feel like, again, that they can participate. They can ask you questions. They can really understand this process a little bit better. And the consumer is in charge. That's not to say they're always right, but they are in charge of the information that they have about you. Again, it's not just they walk through your doors and what you choose to share with them is what they will know about you or about the process. They are in charge of gathering information. It's on their timetable. If they want to be up on their phone in the middle of the night looking at your profile or checking out your website, they can. And so the saying that we have at House is you guys kind of have this responsibility to cultivate nice stalkers. You want people stalking you. You want to give people a reason to come back to your house profile, to come back to your website. Give them enough information that you're gonna do this. So we're gonna talk about some of this. So a couple things that you guys can do to really reach this engaged consumer these days. First of all, storytelling. This is a big one. How you guys can differentiate your brand online. So this, we're gonna use House as an example. This is a profile that we see all too often on House. Um, it's factual, right? We have a general contractor, they're in San Francisco, they do renovation and remodels, great. Is there any reason to come back and look at this again? Do you wanna stalk this person? No, I got the information I need, now I'm moving on to the next person. But this one, that's a whole different story. Right away when you look at it, there's a lot of information to take in. First of all, there's this nice, friendly guy. All right, already I feel a little more comfortable. He could be nice to work with. So you start to look at it and there's a lot of information. And then if you start to read the profile information, our 17 years of successful practice comes from dedication to building long-term relationships with our clients and team collaborators. In fact, we set out to make every client a client for life. Our team is dedicated to getting it right every time, combining decades of past experience with inventive problem solving. So they're doing a really good job of touching on both those emotional and rational things, right? They're talking about how important it is that this is not just a thanks for your check, good luck with everything. I wanna make sure that this is a lasting relationship, that this is gonna go well for both of us. But they're also then touching on that rational side of things. Our 17 years of successful practice. Okay, they've been doing this for a while, they've been around, they probably know what they're doing. Our team is dedicated to getting it right every time, combining decades of past experience. So something to think about when you guys are talking about your business, think about that emotional side of things. What inspires you? What are the projects that you like to work on? I should feel excited when I read your business description, when I read your about me section on your website. I should feel the excitement. Because if you're not excited about what you do, why would I be excited about hiring you to do this project? So give us a little insight into you. The other thing with things being online, well, a little nosy, right? We feel like we can get to know people online. I can look at your Facebook. I can look at pictures of you. So give people a little bit of that sense when they're reading, again, your About Me section, your business description. Tell a little bit of your history. How did you get here? Why are you doing this? So this is a little thing and we see it on house. So our engineers are amazing as they're going through and watching everybody's trends and what they look for. Having a personal picture versus a logo makes a huge difference in if people will click into your profile and how long they will stay there. Because that person, just like on Jeff King's profile we were just looking at, he seems like a friendly guy. I could imagine working with him. This smiling face we see right here, I could imagine inviting him into my home, working together. A logo is a little bit like a Yellow Pages listing these days. It doesn't really do anything for you. Um, we see them all the time. You know, like I said, I own a consulting company in San Francisco. So I spent a lot of time and a lot of money getting that logo just right. So it was very hard for me to realize that no one else cared. That I was the only one that was that invested in that logo. 
So for those of you guys that maybe are a little bit of attached, you want that branding, um, if you are gonna be in the picture, maybe wear a shirt that has your logo, a team photo, have everyone wear that shirt so people can still see it. But really the important piece is faces. Um, again, if it's whoever founded your company, if it's the entire team, I've seen people in canoes, it really doesn't matter as long as we can see this is a real person that I can imagine working with on this process. Okay, so some tips for you guys to have some successful storytelling. Personal history. None of you guys, I can't imagine, were born doing what you do today. So let us know how you got here. What was the training? How long have you been doing it? Why are you excited about this? What are the projects that you like to work on? Again, I want to see the passion. I want to feel that you are just excited about working on this with me as I am about doing this project. Put yourself in the client's shoes and answer the questions people are asking are kind of you know one in the same here. So you guys probably get some of those questions all the time. You've heard them before. There's probably one or two things that either you know, you're waiting for somebody to ask you when you're having those first meetings, or you know that it's probably a concern, like staying on budget, right? That's a big concern for most people. We all wish we had all clients that didn't care about what the budget was, but for most people, they're a little concerned with it. So instead of waiting for them to address those things or bring them up to you, answer them in your about me and in your business description and where you guys are talking about your business. When you walk through our doors, the first thing we're gonna do is sit down and go over your budget to make sure that every product and design decision we make is gonna stay within that. Or whatever those questions or concerns that you guys regularly get, answer those right up front. Because again, people wanna feel like they can get 70% of the way there. And now all of a sudden you're the professional and it's like you're in their head. They haven't even asked you anything and you're already talking about those questions that they had. Or you're already addressing those concerns and they haven't said anything. It's a huge relationship builder. And again, people want to connect with people. Just because things are online now, that hasn't changed. So make sure you're giving people that personal connection. I'll tell you guys from our house and home survey that we do, it's now the largest industry study. Um, we ask everybody on house, we got about 190,000 responses to it. And one of the things that we ask is when you're going to hire a professional, what are the top five most important things? Number one, every year it's the same, reviews. Even if someone got your name as a uh, referral, apparently we don't trust that anymore. We want to see what strangers thought. So we have to be able to see online reviews. Then it's, are you a personality I can work with? Have you completed projects like mine, both in size and scope? Are you an expert in your field? And then the fifth one, and only 9% of people said that being the lowest cost option was important. Instead, it's, have you done this before? Are we gonna have a good time? Do other people agree that this is actually gonna be a good time and you know what you're doing? So some things to keep in mind when you guys are building this online presence. So another huge thing that I cannot stress enough, when you guys are doing your online storytelling, photography. There is nothing you could say, as I just finished telling you guys how important it is to have this great business description, there is nothing you could say that is as powerful as a beautiful photo. When people come to house, it is the first thing they look at, that is the first way that they're finding you guys. They're going in, they're looking at our photo stream to fall in love with all of these beautiful photos. So it's really critical that you guys are getting your photos online. They should be on your website. You need to have them on your house profile. Any other social presence that you have, Photos of the work that you've done, especially before and after photos, are really powerful. So one of the things on house that I do want to stress to you guys is no matter where your photo ends up, whether it's 10,000 people save it to an idea book, our editors feature it, your name will always stay on it. And within one click, it's always going to go back to your professional profile. So let that be a test. If this is the only photo that someone sees of mine, do I feel like it accurately represents the very best work that I do? If it doesn't, don't waste your time on it. Because when we go back to what I was talking about at the beginning, that empowered client, that they are gathering information about you in micro moments, that moment when they see a photo with your name on it is now setting the tone for who you are as a business. So these photos are really critical for you guys. I'm not gonna make eye contact with anyone. I was talking with a builder yesterday and he was showing me these beautiful pictures and was like, I know, I need to get them up. And I was like, Literally everyone he showed me exactly matched the kitchen and bath trends information that I was just sharing. He's like, look at this beautiful one with the doors that open up to the outside. One of the biggest demands that we see nowadays in design is that 
homeowners want their spaces to open up to other rooms and to the outdoors. They want a space that is easy and to entertain and socialize. They want all of these things, they have these design ideas, and nothing more clearly says, I can do this, I've done it before, than looking at your photos. So make sure that you're getting those up there and they tell a very clear story about your business. So we like to tell the story of Modern Craft Construction. Actually, a Texas group here, architect, was with the firm. They were doing a lot of traditional architecture work, but he really loved modern stuff. So he actually changed his um, house profile, kind of started his own thing here. You can see named it Modern Craft Construction, and then took all of his photos of modern work and put them up on his house profile. He now has, I think, five people working for him and is strictly doing only modern work because all of his photography tells a very clear story. So another thing for you guys, for those of you that are maybe wishing that you could get into a different style of work that you want to do, or you're really wanting to send your business in one direction, think about your photos. Do they clearly tell that story of where you want to go? Again, with the test of, does this accurately represent the best work that you do? Does it represent the work that you want to do? If you're wanting your business to go in a certain direction, if maybe you're only wanting to focus on modern work, make sure that your photos reflect that. Um, we do have our house photography network for any of you guys that are needing a photographer. Um, so it's house.com forward slash get photos. So it's a free network, just any of you guys that need a reference point here. Um, we found a ton of photographers were making profiles on house, so we put them all in one place and said it's totally free for everybody, but there's a catch. You have to be willing to offer eight daytime photos at a discounted price point. So $200, $750, or $1,500. Again, it's free for everybody to be a part of. It's just a way to organize them. Um, so you guys can go in here, find your area, see photographers in your space. And they have profiles just like everyone else on house. So for those of you that are needing to get some good photos, again, I can't stress it enough. This is a good resource if you want to work with someone. OK, finally. One last thing, um, community engagement. So when you guys have this telling your brand, you know, online marketing. So I know it feels a little outdated posting in these discussion boards, but it's actually a really big piece. So again, to go back to this house and home survey of what homeowners are looking for, they want to see what it's going to be like to work with you. They want to get a sense of your personality. And this is a big deal, right? They've probably been saving and planning for this for a long time. So they want to make sure that this is great. Well, a good way to show off, one, that you're an expert in your field, and two, the other thing they were looking for, are you a personality I can work with, is by participating in discussions. So like I said, you can use house, go online, there are a ton of discussions happening, whether it's on house or on other sites. But taking a couple minutes to answer these questions really shows that you would be willing to take the time to answer this person's question. We actually, again, when we're surveying homeowners on house, tell us it's a really big thing. It's one of the things they look for, especially when they've now narrowed it down to maybe one or two professionals. They're trying to decide who they're going to go with. They look to see if the professional has taken the time to answer some questions. It can be as silly as, where would you place this rug? Or we have a lot of polls about paint color. Would you pick this blue or that blue? Literally, you going in and saying, I think you should pick this blue that you see up here, this gray fuzzy. Um, just the fact that you took the time to answer someone's question means a lot to them. It shows that you're actually, again, invested in this process. And if you don't mind, can we save questions till the end? Again, I feel like I may run out of time. And somebody yell at me if we're getting close. So going on and just participating in some discussions, a little thing that you guys can do, but it's going to make a big difference. OK. so. When you guys are thinking about your online marketing, arm your virtual team. Tell your story and make a human connection. Spend some time. Even when you guys are putting your photos up and talking about the projects that you've done, tell us a little story. Again, get me invested so I want to stalk you. Why was the homeowner doing whatever they're doing? Why are they building this home or making adjustments? What did they want to accomplish? How did you overcome some challenges? Tell me a story so I'm invested in your work. I see these beautiful photos. But I should really feel all the thought and effort that went into this project. Strive for consistency. What's the story that you're trying to tell in your business description, in the photos that you put up in your stories? And make sure that becomes very clear so people understand exactly what they're going to get from you. 
and then engage in the community. It's a little thing that can make a big difference. We're looking for that human connection. Now sometimes that has become a personal photo instead of a logo and answering a question in a discussion board, but that's how we're starting to make that personal connection. Okay, so these are some things that you guys are gonna do to start to get some new clients. We're now gonna go into the second piece of the presentation. Once you're starting to get this, and once clients are starting to come knocking, you're getting these, what do you do to move people through this process? Make sure that you're focusing on the right people that are calling you so that you can really take on the right projects. So one of the biggest things that we see is you have to have a process in place for screening leads that come in. Again, as a small business owner, I get it. I've made the mistake of every time that phone rang, I was like, absolutely, I would love to work with you. When can we sign the contract? And then a couple months later, you're going, huh, really should have thought that through. I kind of wish I wouldn't have taken on this project. But it's hard as a small business owner. But this is actually something that we know will make a big difference when you guys are a little bit more selective about who you're working with. So you have to have a process in place as you guys are screening leads. One of the biggest thing, of course, it's going to save time in that long term. It's going to increase your win rate because, of course, you're focusing on people that are actually a good fit for your business and what you do. And then it's going to maximize on your return. So we like to pull quotes from professionals in our community. So advice I received from another architect, sometimes you make more money on the projects you don't get. It's that moment when you're six months in and you realize the amount of time that's going into this, I really wish I could go back in time and maybe say no on this. Don't end up in that situation. So make sure you have some steps in place. So one of the things for screening leads, first up the discovery call, so research, Anywhere you look says the quicker you respond to something, the more likely it is you're going to move forward with that project. So if not all of you can be sitting at your phone or your computer all day long, every day, you have to have a process in place for how you can respond immediately even when you can't actually respond immediately. So one of the biggest things, strike while the iron is hot, make sure that you have something set up on your voicemail and your email out of office when you can't be there and make it a little bit specific. I'm actually out on a job site today in Houston. I'm not going to be back at my desk until 7 p.m., so most likely you won't hear from me till 9 a.m. tomorrow. Or on your voicemail, hey, I'm out at a job site for the next 24 hours. I will get back to you by the end of the day tomorrow. Please tell me a little bit about your project. Even though you haven't actually talked to that person, it feels like, okay, I actually got a response. You've set my expectation for what I'm going to hear from you. When someone calls and we all have the tendency, okay, I'm ready, I want to talk to you, I want to ask questions, and I don't hear back from you, okay, well, do you not want to work with me? Do you not care about my project? Because that's what my focus is now. We sort of lose perspective, right? So you want to manage that expectation. Some people I've seen, and it works, if you want to use your email um, out of office, have it something a little bit specific. Hey, I'm going to be out on the job site for the next 24 hours, but why don't you go ahead and respond back to this and tell me, what you're looking to have done, and what your time frame is. Again, it feels like this conversation is moving forward, even though you haven't had a conversation yet. Be direct, and take the lead and ask some essential questions right from the beginning, which I'm gonna go into more detail here. So Jody Rose in Design, I always follow up with a phone call. I find talking to people on the phone gives me a better sense of what they're about, and if their needs align with my skills. Having the initial interaction on the phone works well for me and is a time saver. My team always laughs whenever I read this slide because I hate the phone. I'm all usually running through an airport or I'm standing at an event, so an email or a text is just easier for me to respond to, but I do get it. If you take the time to have a phone call, even though it feels like I don't have time to sit here, there's a lot you can get. Do they sound nervous? Are they excited? What is a little bit of their tone? You can get a better sense of them that you just can't get from in writing. And again, it starts to build that personal connection with them. So have those first conversations on the phone. So taking the lead, what do we mean? Well, first determine a lead source. How did you learn about us? That had better be the first question that all of you guys are asking. And two reasons why it's so important. One, obviously for your marketing efforts, you need to know what's working, and this is the only way you're gonna know. Make them be specific. If they're like, oh, I think I saw you online maybe. Oh great, did you see my website? Did you see my house profile? Was it Facebook? Find out exactly where they saw you because whether you're spending money on marketing or it's just your time, you need to know what's working for you so you can focus there. The other reason why this is important to know where they found out about you is because this is going to give you a better idea of what they know about you. If they found you on your website, well, you know what is on your website. So they've been able to read some testimonials and see some pictures. They found your house profile. They saw pictures. They could read your business description, read reviews. Did they see you on social media? 
Maybe they got your name as a referral, but that client was a really small project, so odds are they probably don't know much about you or this process. It's gonna give you a better sense of how to manage this conversation. Build trust. So a lot of times, especially for homeowners, and my poor dad has become my example these days because he just built a custom home in Minnesota where I was born and raised. Um, so I watched him go through this process and it was a little funny to be talking about it and then see him actually go through this. And he had been planning and he was excited building this house on the lake. And then he went in and the builder was asking him some questions and he's like, I kind of froze. I didn't know how to answer. But when we were like, well, just tell me about what you're thinking. Like, why do you want to build a house? What is your dream of what it would be like? That was a lot easier for him to answer. So start to build that relationship. Just, all right, love that you called me. Tell me a little bit about what you're thinking. Like, why'd you call me today? And then determine fit by asking some essential questions, which I know sounds like a contradiction. Tell me a story. Now I'm going to ask you some essential questions here. But these are right from the beginning. Remember, this is, okay, how can you maximize your time? How can you streamline this for both you and for that potential client and make sure this goes quickly right from the beginning? And I think we have the tendency to leave it at that. Oh, tell me about your project. That sounds great. I'll get back to you. But use this right from the beginning, that first phone call to yes, build some trust, but let's start to set some boundaries. So authority, who needs to be involved to make the decision? I hear all too often that you're cruising along on a project, you feel like you're making decisions left and right, and then all of a sudden, you know, I kinda wanna ask my spouse for their opinion or maybe my kids and see what they think, and you're like, oh, I know what that means. That means half of these decisions that we just made, we're gonna have to go back over. So don't waste your time. Anyone that needs to be part of this conversation, even if it's just spitballing ideas so that you can pull together a proposal, needs to be there from the very beginning. Maximize that time. Need, why are they doing this? Is this project a fit? Do they actually understand your services? So understanding their project a little bit better. Again, you know, when we see this on house, I saw it with my dad, just not knowing what everyone does, how you guys fit together, and it's a little bit different. So the builder that he was working with actually had an in-house interior designer. He didn't know that when he went in because that was different with different builders that he went to. So make sure they fully understand, okay, what exactly are you looking to get done? Well, that might be a little bit outside of what we do, so I think maybe who you need to talk to is over here. Find out right away. Urgency and timeline. Why'd they call now? Is there anything holding them back? Are they just really excited about your pictures and wanted to chat with you, but really they're not ready to start for two years? Or they just found out they're having triplets, so they need this project done yesterday. Does that match with your timeline and when you can actually do a project? And then budget and money. Are they actually ready to spend the money? Have they thought through how they're gonna finance it? These are things you need to find out right from the very beginning because it's gonna very clear, clearly tell you is this worth an additional conversation or more time. So a purposeful interior says, I asked them about their goals. What about their home do they like? Why are they making a change? This is a key part in me being able to achieve their expectation. It's much easier for people sometimes to have these conversations. What are you looking to do? Well, um, we want something bigger. Okay. Well, tell me about your house now. Why isn't it working for you? Sometimes that's an easier thing to explain than exactly what they're looking for in that new project. It'll help you see that big picture. Jared Lewis Construction, the most important thing I do is try to ensure that all parties involved in the decision process are at the meetings. I can't tell you how many times I've had a great meeting and come up with a game plan only to find out that others involved had a different vision. If anyone has the power of veto, I ask that they be present. And sometimes it can feel a little bit premature to demand that just from a first phone call. But if you feel like this could be a good fit, you might as well make sure everyone's on the same page right from the very beginning. So building an ideal customer profile, this is huge. So every one of you guys should have an ideal customer profile and everyone in your company should have that written out in front of them. They're taking a phone call, they're answering an email, they should know exactly who it is you're trying to work with. And an ideal customer profile is gonna include a few things. The location of the project, scope of the project, their timeline and level of motivation, budget, money, and amount of research done on you, your work, their project, so the answers to all of these are gonna be very different for each one of you. It's just important that each one of you are very clear about what they are for you. You may have five different locations that are priority for you and you're happy to go to any one of those suburbs. They're all great. Scope of the project though, you are really looking to cut down. You wanna do like three to four really big projects through the year and that's it. 
timeline or level of motivation. You have the timeline of when you're available. Maybe you want them to have done no research and hand everything over to you with a huge budget. Whatever it is for you guys, you just need to be very clear about that. So you know when you get that lead and you're answering all of these questions, okay, what priority is this person? Is this a good fit for where we're at and where we wanna go? So I think this is gonna be a good test of my memory. Sorry, we lost the projector again. Um, I was gonna say a good test of my memory to see what's next and then I distracted myself. So I was gonna show you guys an example, Modern Craft Construction. I don't know if they're next, but I know that it's coming up. They have an ideal customer checklist that they use. Everyone in the company has it and they actually put a score on people. So once someone comes in, they're able to give them a score in these areas, give them an overall score, so that when they're going through, when are we gonna place priority, what's gonna be our focus, it's very clear to everybody. And this is gonna change a little bit for those of you guys that maybe have been listening to our webinars. We're doing one that's all about marketing success. And so when you guys are coming up with a marketing plan and when you're looking at focusing on certain clients, you have to think about, okay, what is my end goal right now? And it's gonna change, but it's important to take one. Do I wanna increase revenue? Do I wanna change the size or location of the projects that I'm doing? Do I wanna increase just my life happiness? What is that end goal? And then when you look at that ideal customer profile, evaluate it against that end goal. Do these checklist items, the location, the size of project, the scope, are they gonna get me closer to that larger business goal? And that should be something that's very clear to all of you guys. Huh. Oh, there we go. One of the most important things as a designer is to know who your ideal client is. Knowing the profile and demographics of your ideal client makes it easy to screen any inquiry you receive. Thank you. For instance, my ideal clients are busy people who want an interior design firm to handle everything from concept to completion. Again, it's gonna be a little bit different for all of you guys. It's just important that you are very clear about who they are so that you can start to prioritize people as they're getting, as they're coming in, but also so that you make sure every project that you take on is getting you to that larger business objective that you want. So this is that ideal client checklist I was talking to you guys. There's a lot of them online. Literally, if you go on and just Google ideal client profile, you can look at images or examples. There's a lot of different variations that will fit for you guys. Again, it's just important that you have it and you are very clear. Everyone in your company is very clear. Anyone that you are working with, for those of you guys that are on Pro Plus on House, they should be very clear. Make sure your account rep knows these are the people that we want because they're gonna be able to make adjustments and give advice. Oh, I didn't know that you wanted to change and get this type of project. Let's make all of these adjustments to get you there. So make sure everyone's really clear about this. All right, what do you need to do to win the business? You're getting these great leads coming in, you're being particular, you're asking some questions. So what are some keys for closing? Well, get in alignment, address any blockers, create micro contracts for next steps, and then ask for a deposit. Now this isn't gonna work for everybody, but even if it's $50, are you willing to put your credit card down? If someone is not, that is gonna be a huge red flag of they're probably as excited as they are about this project and they have lots of great ideas, eh, they're probably not super confident about moving forward or working with you. It's gonna give you a good idea. So what do I mean by get in alignment? So first, again, meet face to face. There's a lot you can tell from body language. Do they actually seem excited about this? Are they nervous? You're just gonna get a better sense for them, but also you're gonna start to build that relationship because it goes from just being sort of this idea of maybe working with you to now sitting down face to face, we're excited, we're talking about specifics for this project. It now starts to become more of, we are actually working together. This is a working relationship. They can start to envision that versus just maybe I'm thinking about it in theory. Use a two-step close. So two-step close is really simple. It's literally repeat back what you heard. So this is, again, making sure that you're completely in alignment. So when they're like, okay, and then when I'm building my house, what I want here, great. So what I just heard from you is that what you would really like to do is actually take down, sorry, Michael, we lost it again. Um, take down this half wall and open it up to the living room and to the outside, because right then they're gonna be able to say, no, 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 when I said open it up, what I really meant was adding more windows or something. So again, making sure that you're being really efficient with your time and being really clear. Everything someone says, make sure that you're repeating it back and fully understand it. Just share success stories. 
We know, you know, that people want references. They have to see reviews on you. It's the number one thing that they're looking for. Don't wait for them to ask. Go into that meeting. So from that initial phone call, you started to pull a little information from them. You know a little bit about their project. Have some references ready. Maybe of people in their neighborhood or area or people that have done a project similar to the one that they want to do. Have those right there. Great, I'm gonna jot down some notes, make sure I really have all the details from this conversation. I would love it if you would read re these references here. Already now, you're starting to check off those boxes, you're getting them there. And then use this or that to close. So obviously when you give someone one option, what's their answer gonna be, yes or no? But if you give them option A and option B, now they're gonna be able to say to you, okay, I really like this from option A, but I also kinda like this from option B, Okay, now that gives you a place to continue moving forward with this process. So creating a micro contract, um, all a micro contract is is a game plan for what you're gonna do next and you're putting some time around it. Great, this is a good meeting, love sitting down with you. I'm gonna go back to my office and I am gonna pull together two proposals. I'm gonna need 72 hours to get those together. In the meantime, I need within the next 48 hours from you to go and save some photos so I make sure that I fully understand the style you're looking for in this project. It's so literally just making an agreement for what the next step is and setting that expectation of time, which is a huge one. We all have that when someone's like, I'll get right back to you. Oh, well, it's been an hour. Why haven't I heard back from you? To someone else, they're like, oh, it's been three days. If I hear from them in a week, that means get right back. But be very clear about that expectation because that's a big one that will throw people off. So make sure you're setting that micro contract and then ask them to get a little bit involved. Um, one of the reasons that people always ask about why do I need the house app and I don't get what I do with it? Well, it's kind of a nice visual portfolio for you. So when you're sitting down, now when you're having that first meeting, you can say, let's create an idea book together. Even if they already have one, sit down and create one together. And show me like five of your favorite photos in here. Because again, now it's starting to set that. They're a little more invested in this process and now they're kind of envisioning, now you guys are actually working together, maybe signing that contract is more of a formality. Really, you've just started this process already. So Atlantic Closet and Storage Solutions, ideally we set up the next meeting or at least a time frame within which to follow up before concluding each meeting or phone call. Never end a meeting or appointment without an agreement and time frame for the next step. Again, just want to make sure that you're efficiently keeping things moving. What time is it? 11.37, yes, I can talk faster, don't worry. Okay, so top tips when you're getting these great leads coming in, what do you need to do to efficiently make sure that you're moving forward and you're gonna close that deal? Develop an ideal client checklist, make sure everyone is very clear and make sure that it's in writing. There's a difference when you think you've got it in your head and then the phone rings and you're like, wait, what did I say the priority was? Make sure that that's written down very clearly. Screen leads to save time and ensure fit, and this is tough sometimes, especially as a small business, but try to be critical about this process. Focus on the projects that are really gonna be a good fit, that you know at the end of this you're gonna get that five-star review. Create a micro-contract for next steps. Just an agreement on, I know what I can expect from you, you know what you can expect from me, and what is the time frame within which that's gonna happen. And then ask clients to put some skin in the game, whether that's a small deposit, whether it's just creating an idea book, something to get them invested and keep this moving forward. It'll also help you gauge how serious they are. Okay, finally, last little section here. So you've done a great job of your online marketing. You're reaching all of these people, so you're getting these folks in. Then you're screening them and you're focusing on those ideal clients. You're signing the best contracts you've ever had. What do you need to do to make sure that through this process you get to the end and you get that five-star review? So some conversations that you guys need to have to make sure that you are on the same page. And I don't even have my computer, so I can't cheat on what the next slide is. All right, so the thing is to look at those issues that you know you're gonna run into, right? What are the biggest problems that will cause some friction and some chaos through the process? Cost, staying on budget, timing when things start to go off schedule and then process really big thing to remember for all of you guys again you've done this you do this all the time you know what to expect you know what pitfalls may come up that's different for someone else again my dad doesn't know that he's my example but he built a house before him and my mom built the house the first time now they're doing it again so he's like i know what to expect and literally would come home from every meeting and was like, I feel like I have a headache. Like there are so many questions, I just forgot all the things that are involved in it. Make sure you help walk them through. So this is what it's gonna look like. 
we're going to have these meetings, then we have to talk about getting permits. Timing on that, man, that can just get off track really easily. Here's what I've seen happen in the past. And don't shy away from those problem issues. We always want to be positive, right? And we're just going to hope for the best and they're not going to be the case in this time and I don't want to scare someone. But when we know what to expect, and again, you guys have dealt with it, you know if it's coming or not, it could be an issue. When your homeowner, when your client also is a little bit aware, hey, this could be a problem, here's what I'm gonna do to manage it, here's what I can do on my end. If, heaven forbid, those things do happen, then it's a little bit more like, you've got this, you expect, you know, you knew that this could be an issue and you're gonna handle it. So make sure you walk people through the process. Modern craft construction. I tell my clients there are three components to any project. Time, budget, and quality. You can pick two of the three, but I can't give you all three. Everyone inevitably picks budget and quality. This has been a really effective way for us to set timeline expectations at the beginning of our projects. Two reasons why I love this quote. One, because you're being realistic, right? I cannot do this at the lowest price point on your budget in the shortest amount of time with the highest quality. That's just not the reality. So being realistic about that and sort of putting that back into perspective, but I also love that it puts it back on the client. I'm not gonna decide for you. You have to very clearly tell me what are your priorities. Is it budget, quality, time? What can we agree on? Okay, this is what you're saying is your priority. That's what we're gonna focus on. So putting that back on them to place that priority. Thomas Dex, on the front page of our website, I announce we are not the cheapest, we are not the fastest, but our testimonials are proof that we can make our clients happy. Being realistic about it, right? You guys know that's just the way it is. There is no point in pretending otherwise. So be upfront about that. Again, managing that expectation for the clients and sort of giving them that reality check is a good reminder. Because when you see it out loud, you're like, well, of course, that makes perfect sense. But sometimes, especially from the client side, they forget. So be realistic about those things. So talking about process and budget, we know that these are big hot button issues that can cause some tension through the project. So first of all, best practices. So when we're talking about communication, setting boundaries and being proactive, um, and then also don't overextend. So what we mean is outline appropriate communication. So again, I travel a lot for my job, so it's perfectly normal that no one knows what time zone I'm in and when I'm delayed in an airport at 3 a.m., I'm like, oh, this is the perfect time to respond to everybody. Well, other, one, other people may not appreciate getting a text message at three o'clock in the morning. For you guys, right from the beginning, set that expectation. So just so you know, I'm usually out on job sites until about four o'clock. So I'm not gonna get back to my desk. So if you email me or call me, just know I'm probably not gonna be able to get back to you. Or 24 hours is probably appropriate with everything going on, so don't panic. The other nice thing about this with communication is it opens up the door on their side. Most people will respond back with, okay, I get that. I am in the office though until about five o'clock and when I leave and I'm home with my family, you're not gonna hear from me. Or it's not gonna be until after 9 p.m. I put the kids to bed, then sometimes I get back online. So right from the beginning, set that expectation. Email, phone, you know, once you've already had it, you've met them in person, now you can go back to email and text messages. But set that up right away. What are your best practices for communication? And then make sure you understand that from their end. So again, no one's getting frustrated with that. Just be proactive about it and then don't overextend. You guys know what the deal is, right? I wish I liked being on the phone. I wish I was better about it. The reality is I'm not. So instead of telling people, of course I'll call you. We can have long chats on the phone. I just have to be honest about, all right, I don't love it. I'll text you. If I have some time, I can call you. Sorry. I think we're talking about budget. Maybe that was the end of communication. It's a very pretty flower from my mom's garden. I have no idea why that pops up as my screensaver there, but hope you guys enjoy. So EA custom mill work. I do my best early on to set boundaries regarding lines of communication. During initial visits, I make it clear that most business happens between 7 a.m. and 5 p.m. A gentle suggestion regarding appropriate times of day for discussing choices of materials, which sub to use, and schedule. Set a precedent which becomes routine once the job commences. You know, and the reality is I think we all can get into some unhealthy habits. We are mobile people. We have our phones on us all the time. So it a little bit becomes the expectation that I can text you or hear from you all the time. So again, just make sure you set that expectation. Talking about money. So how you guys can set, set budgets here, handle proposals, deal with changes, and then of course, getting paid. So if you guys have noticed, 
The biggest rule here is set expectations right from the beginning. We all do a little bit better when we very clearly understand what those guidelines are. So budgets and proposal tips. Walk people through past project details. Provide a budget, then adjust, and then stick to your pricing practices. So this is a great thing that mom, the builder did with my dad. He actually sat down, walked through a project that was pretty similar to the one that my dad wanted to do, and literally went line by line of, this is what that costs. This is what that siding costs. Those windows that you're looking at, this is the cost of it. So very clearly he could see, I feel like it takes all of the guesswork out. We all can't help but be a little bit skeptical, especially when it's something that we can't do ourselves. Is that really the best price? Is that actually what it costs? Are you ripping me off on this? But to see it actually laid out line by line, okay? And it also starts to set some perspective for them. You guys have probably had a situation where someone comes to you with a picture and you're like, this is a kitchen I want. You're like, that's great. That's a $2 million kitchen and you have a $10,000 budget. Sometimes seeing those line items puts it a little bit into perspective of, okay, I had no idea that custom cabinets actually cost that much. Maybe we need to make some adjustments. So sanctuary kitchen and bath design. I bring a copy of the contract showing the actual cost of the project in the picture that they liked. I walk through the different materials and fees and discuss their own projects versus the one in the picture. Our customers appreciate that we share information that is real and it sets budget expectations at a realistic level from the very beginning. It's also a good way to work with them on, okay, so this is the reality of that picture. This is what makes it really expensive. Something for you guys to think about, this is an aside, but when you guys are putting your photos and your projects up, it's not a bad thing to talk about, maybe the budget of the kitchen or of the house you're talking about, and maybe say a couple things that put it at that price point. Because they wanted all custom cabinets. And those appliances are top of the line that were flown in from Italy, I don't know. Whatever it is, that's what makes it this expensive kitchen. So some things that you can do when you're dealing with budget are, look at different appliances, here are some different factors. People help, it helps kind of set that expectation before people come to you. But especially when you're sitting down and having those actual conversations. Aggie Design says, I meet clients at their space and we discuss the project and I give them an estimate of the project cost then and there, including materials and labor. Usually my estimate is at least 50% higher than what they thought it would be. Then when they tell me their budget, I adjust the scope to fit whatever it was that they gave me. So part of the point on this quote here is sort of giving them that number, and I'm sure you guys run into it sometimes where people are having a hard time giving you their budget. They don't really want to give you that number because they're nervous. If they tell you your, their budget, then you're just going to spend all of it to that budget. So sometimes it helps just to sit there and like, yep, you know what, off the top of my head, I think it's going to be this. They're going to give you a reaction or like, whoa, I was thinking a million dollars that or whatever it is. Now all of a sudden you have a number and like, okay, well, the reason that I gave you that budget is I was thinking of this, this, and this. Here's some ways that we can now do it at your budget. So it opens up that conversation. You're being real about it. So educating to set expectations. So this is a big thing you guys can do, one, to help bring clients in, but also then when people come to you, they're a little bit more educated. Showroom in the Chicago area holds education ses sessions every Wednesday non-sales, nothing about their product. It is literally just educating people about the remodeling process, about building a custom home. But now all of a sudden, you're starting to build this relationship of trust with people. Like you were willing to give me this information for free. You're trying to help this process be a little bit better for me. So you're building that trust, but also added benefit to be a little selfish. People are now gonna come to you and they're more educated about this process. So it's a little bit easier for you. Put your reviews to work, which we're gonna talk about and then use your website and your profile. So Foley Companies does a really good job on their website of including information that is not just self-serving, but helps with the process. You guys can see custom home process, new home facts, new home remodeling process. They're helping people understand this entire process. One, it's a relationship builder. People feel like they can trust them that they're giving this information away for free, but also self-serving. When people come, they understand this process a little bit better. So I was gonna go back to reviews. So one thing you guys can do here, um, it's really good to get a lot of great reviews and just great testimonials. But then think about those problem issues, communication, what happens if changes occur, what happens with budget. When you guys ask people to review you, ask them to speak to something specific. Hey, will you go in and talk about how we communicated through this large process? I would love it if you would go in and review me. Can you 
review or talk about in the review how I helped you stay on budget and how we dealt with when changes occurred here when we were dealing with budget. People like it, it gives them a little direction of okay, now I know what I'm gonna focus on and actually write this review, but it's also gonna speak to these problem issues that people may have in this process. So contracts, this is a big one here all too often and we do wanna be nice and sometimes contracts can feel a little bit intimidating and scary. Never go without a contract from the very beginning. Contracts should not be a scary, intimidating thing and like don't worry, it's just one page, just sign it, we'll deal with it. That is a terrible idea both for you and for the homeowner. The longer your contract, it's like guardrails for everybody. It's your safety net. So everybody knows what the process is gonna be. Everyone knows what to expect if changes come up or you get off of budget or off of your timeline. So a contract should be something that you propose as a really positive thing for everybody. Let's go through this so we all are on the same page, we really understand what's happening. And it's again, all too often I hear from the beginning, people are like, oh, I don't, you know, I don't wanna scare people off with it, but it really should be something that you guys propose or position as a really positive thing here. So how do you handle difficult conversations? I think I'm over time. So handle difficult conversations, don't avoid them. Um, you can tell if someone's feeling a little bit uncomfortable about things. You can tell if there are issues, maybe they're being a little bit passive aggressive. This is not the time to just hope for the best and keep things moving. Right from the very beginning, you know, it seems like you're asking me about something. It seems like you're not happy. Tell me what's going on here. Have those conversations. One thing that we've heard from professionals that they've been really, have worked positively for them is right from the beginning they say, I wanna make sure I get a five star review from you at the end of this process. If at any point you feel like you could not give me that five star review, let's have a conversation about it because I wanna change it immediately. You should feel at the end of this like everything was exceptional, but I can't do that unless you communicate. So set right from the beginning that even an awkward conversation, you guys need to have it and address it. Durango Development says, I ask direct questions back to them. What can I do to make the project better? Are you asking for a discount? Do you feel that we are working or have worked hard for you? I have found that usually difficult clients blur boundaries or they're passive aggressive. Direct questions eliminate the games. Remember, you're the professional. It's not personal. This is a very emotional project for a lot of people. It's a lot of money. It's something they're gonna have to live with day in and day out. It's easy to get emotional about it. It's your job to remain calm, even if that means wine at 10 a.m., no judgment. Remain calm and then keep things professional. All right, so top tips. Conversations are better in person. There's a lot you can get from them. Be upfront about trade-offs, cost, timing, and quality. It's the reality. There's no need to ignore this. Position process as a benefit. That contract is there to make everybody feel good and so that everybody knows how this process is gonna go and how we're gonna handle issues. Never work without a contract detailing process, timing, cost, and change impact. And that is how you guys are gonna get more clients, land the deal, and make sure you get the five-star review. Sorry for talking so fast at all of you. Again, I'm Lindsay at House with an EY. If you guys can shoot me an email if you have any questions about House, about your online marketing. I'm also in the House booth with my colleagues, so pop over and say hi or ask me other questions. So with that, thank you, and hopefully it's not too late.